and directs the clinic which provides medical care for more than 20,000 persons with HIV and infectious diseases in Chennai. Whenever there is scientific research and publications, I think Kumar constitutes a very important phase of HIV AIDS research in India. I think I'm very sure he will take us through the journey of making a presentation what is new in ERT guidelines for resource limited settings. Over to you, Dr. Kumar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moti. So, um, good morning, everyone. I'm sure Dr. Ganga, you'll do a better presentation. I, sorry, I harassed you to do the first. He just arrived and uh, we made him to speak. Okay. So what I'm going to do probably in the next 25 minutes is I'm going to talk what is new in the current you know, guidelines for the management of HIV, you know, which has been launched by the WHO, which has been adopted by many resource limited settings. And also at the later part of my talk, which also I will give you little snippets, what's going to change in the next couple of years. And also like to tell you that I'm also part of this WHO guidelines committee for the last uh, like 15 odd years. Many of you know about this uh, particular um, you know, study uh, called HPTN052, which you'll hear more from Dr. Mayer a little later, and as well as there is a study called START. So these two clinical trials, which again I'm personally was been involved in the context of this study here at Chennai, as well as uh, you know, moving these results into public health. HPTN052 is a study to answer the question of if you give antiretroviral therapy, if you can prevent someone, we answered that, and as well as START is a study which uh, was conducted on HIV infected people with a higher CD4, where we showed that if we start at a higher CD4, it just, uh, prevents uh, not only opportunistic infection, but also various non-communicable diseases. So these two pivotal and landmark trials, which can happen only once in a lifetime, you know, showed that you need to start everyone on treatment. So today, every guideline, either the guideline from Zimbabwe or Chennai or San Francisco or WHO, you know, recommend you need to start treatment everybody. So the first carrying message is anyone HIV positive comes to your clinic, start on treatment. Also, in the WHO guidelines uh, last summer in July, so we are given two more guidance. So this is on people who are coming with advanced HIV disease. The minute when I say start on treatment, you may ask a question, can I start today, the first day, or two days, three days, or one month, or two months? There are studies that have been done by the International uh, AIDS Evaluation uh, Database Group called AIDA of USNH. What they found is, if you find someone as HIV positive, if you won't put them on treatment, if you keep them as pre-ART, if the CD4 is higher, then the loss to follow up is great to the program, as well as they come to the clinic at a later stage and they die. Because they don't come for the next couple of years, the CD4 drops down, come and die in the clinic with the PCP or tuberculosis or one of those opportunistic infections. So following this, WHO made these two guidance. One is called rapid ART initiation. That is, someone comes to you, right, if they're fine, if they have opportunistic infection, put them on treatment, within a week you start on treatment. Here, rapid is one week. Within a week you start on treatment. Don't delay beyond that. Another one is called St uh, same day start. That is, someone comes to your clinic today morning, found positive, perfectly fine, 800 odd CD4, and you counsel them if they are prepared. Don't force anyone. If they are prepared, they can start on treatment, start on treatment. This is what is called same day start, and I'm glad to tell you we have implemented this at YRG Care in Chennai doing very well. The same day start. Come to your clinic, you work upon them, same day you initiate on treatment, which is done by your clinicians or counselors, which you can speak to them later during the breaks. The only conditions where we tell them to delay treatment in HIV infected people is cryptococcal meningitis, which is again a WHO guidance, new, but it's not new, it's the same old, which uh, uh, it was been recommended that someone who is cryptococcal meningitis, treat them, make sure that they are being stable with this, then you know you start on treatment after four to six weeks. This is to prevent immune reconstitution syndrome, which can have some major morbidity. This is the only condition we say that you can um, you know, delay uh, treatment. Or in all the other conditions, start treatment quickly. The next thing is, what to start with? So till today, these are the various drugs which are approved for use for, uh, you know, both in developed world as well as in the developing countries. If you see these, all the black color ones, which are already available um, in, even in Indian market by the generic manufacturers, and the red color ones is currently not available. Hopefully, we should uh, get anytime soon. And again, uh, you'll hear more about this from Dr. Campbell. And again, this is a newer drug, very recently been approved by USFT called Balisumab. You know, all the other drugs have been already been used uh, even in Indian settings. You may ask a question, what to start with in a resource limited setting. So this is a WHO guidelines where you can see from 2010 to 2016 how these guidelines have changed. So now the 2016 guidelines still recommend tenofovir, lamivudine, or emtacitabine if is a preferred. 
And, and alternatively, they also have introduced two regimens, one with doltegravir, another with a lower dose of efavirenz, which again, I will not talk much about this because we did this last year and the previous year disseminating the NCOR results. But again, there is a move now going to happen, which we'll hear in the next uh, couple of months, that to make this doltegravir as a preferred in a resource-limited setting. Currently, it has become a preferred in many settings. That is because the, I think it's not moving. Right, so this uh, DTG is going to become a preferred anytime soon. That is because of the reason that you can see this. Here is this x-axis is various uh, uh, re, you know, countries in, in Africa and as well as in other parts of the world. And y-axis is proportion of the patients who are on having an you know, RTA containing resistance. If you see this uh, red color curve, which is again a uh, yeah, ball mark curve where of 10% baseline um, resistance to an you know, RTA. Again, as you all know that in a public health settings with someone is having in a region, if they have 10% uh, or more of resistant to any strains, either to a virus or to a bacteria or a parasite, you may have to change that uh, particular drug out of the public health guidelines. Again, if you look into this, many of those African countries, if you look into Uganda, Namibia, Zambia, uh, and Zimbabwe, all these, if you see this, their baseline prevalence is more than 10%. That means they cannot use nevirapine or efavirenz anymore, where they have, they have already moved to doctor containing therapy. If we take in Asia, if you see this, we are not cross 10%, but we are closer. If you take Thailand and Philippines. What about in India? So based on whatever available uh, evidence, it could be anything from 5 to 10%. So that means we are, we are there. You know, any moment we are crossing uh, 10%, so it's time that for us to move to doltegravir as a preferred therapy. Again, following this, again, the WHO issued a new guidelines last summer and just launched. Again, in regions, use non-NNRTI, that is with a doltegravir containing therapy for initiation or do HIV drug, drug, drug resistant testing before you start treatment. Either you do a drug resistant testing start treatment like in the US or you start straight away with DTG. Again, this is more expensive, not available everywhere, so better to move on with doltegravir because you do not know your baseline prevalence. So again, the studies have shown in regions where they have um, you know, baseline resistance, higher chance of failure, again, as shown by Dr. Cantor in, from one of our studies, which he, he spoke in our cart in the past. So following this now, most of the guidelines in Africa has moved to doltegravir as a preferred therapy. So India is on the race. Hopefully, we should do, you know, any moment. The next thing uh, which has been, I won't say it's a new, but it's been reiterated again and again is the use of viral loads. You all know that virological failure is the first one to occur and followed by immunological failure and clinical failure. Also, modeling studies have shown it can take anything from six months to two years. That means if you're not doing viral load monitoring, you'll end up in seeing patients after two years with clinical failure, as shown uh, by several of us that if you don't do uh, viral load monitoring, you know, you know, you, you'll not meet the primary objective of an antiretal therapy that to prevent various illness. So today, you know, the WHO guidelines have been strongly recommending to do viral load. They have given a threshold of uh, 1,000 copies, but again, this will change uh, to less than 400 or 150 anytime soon. So when someone who is on therapy after six months, if they are not suppressed, again, improve the adherence and uh, repeat the viral load within three months, and uh, if still are continuously more than 1,000 copies, then you have to change them to the uh, second line of therapy. So if you don't do that, this is again one of our very earlier data which we generated using the Fogarty collaboration with Dr. Mayer many years back that patients who are not doing viral load, if they're doing only CD4 monitoring, if they fail using CD4, then they'll also develop almost 45% of them some opportunistic infections. So that means viral load monitoring is very important for an individual benefit. And also our group have shown in the past and as well as others from Thailand and Africa, if you don't do viral load monitoring, and these uh, individuals can accumulate resistance, which can also jeopardize future regimens like second and third line drugs, which are not being used. And also, I'll go one step ahead. So this is a data from the HPT and 52 study, which has been done to answer the question whether you want to put everyone on treatment to prevent transmission, where again, they've shown that if someone is on antiretroviral drugs, if they have been suppressed, that means they will not transmit infection to others. So that means, again, if you're not doing viral load, you will not do whether they are suppressed or not. So if they are not suppressed, there are likelihood they can transmit infection to others. And also, again, in this study, it's also shown that 11 individuals had unlinked transmission. That means from the community, someone who is HIV positive, they didn't have a suppressed virus, they have transmitted to their partners. So that means viral load is very important, not only for individual benefit, but also for the community prevention. 
So this is a, um, a current guidelines from WHO. So that is someone initiated on treatment within six months do a viral load. It's suppressed, you know, repeat at the 12th month. And if it's suppressed, then repeat every 12 months. And also we are given a new guidance that if someone is suppressed with viral load and if they are very stable and if you're sure that they are going to do viral load monitoring, you can also do away with the CD4 monitoring because CD4 will not have any relevance. So that means you can do away you know, with that. This type of guidance has also been given, but you have to do this by case by case. So now moving to this uh, second line therapy, this is again today in 2018, the guidelines recommend either NNRTI in regions where they have less than 10% prevalence of uh, NNRTI or move them to Daltegravir if it is more than 10%. So when they fail therapy, also the guidelines have recommended um, um, uh, second line therapy, which is change from two NRTIs to a different NRTI, if they're on tenofovir, change to AZT, or if they're on AZT to tenofovir, and you change the NNRTI to one of those PIs. It's been recommended either booster aracemir or lopinavir. The newest change is addition of one daily booster daranavir with 800 milligrams. You may ask a question why this has been added to the new guidelines. So this is a comparative chart between these aracinavir, lopinavir, and daranavir. The earlier guidelines did recommend because the generic formulation of daranavir was not available, but currently it's been available. And also, now we also have a co-formulated with the daranavir and ritonavir, so it's also been available. But still little, little expansive as compared to aracinavir. But on the other hand, if you look at this chart, on looking at the toxicity profile and convenience, it has been much better as compared to aracinavir and lopinavir, and also in terms of bill burden as compared to lopinavir. I'd like to show one particular study which was done by the ACTG group some years back. What they have shown in that particular study is they compared aracinavir versus raltegravir and one daily daranavir. So again, if you look into this particular um, um, uh, slide, you know, there are various bar charts you can see, but just concentrate only on those where I have put an arrow, who shows you know, is the toxicities to these drugs, as a result, they have discontinued that particular regimens. So again, here, if you see this to aracinavir is much higher as compared to raltegravir, and if you see this uh, daranavir, it is mean much lower. So that means aracinavir, which is a preferred therapy in our region for second line, is more toxic to the patients as compared to daranavir. Thereby, I think our region should move forward with the one style of daranavir as a preferred second line therapy in terms of uh, long-term toxicity. So moving to these other options in second line, again, we have uh, in the past have uh, disseminated the second line trial as well as the select trial here. What we showed in that is we randomized patients who have been having an NRTI containing failure to either to the standard WHO containing therapy or to a newer therapy with, with the Proteus inhibitors and an integrase inhibitors. So this is a trial second line study where we showed, again, x-axis is duration week, y-axis is proportion of the patients who got suppressed viral load, where again, this red color curve is patients who are on, on uh, two NRTAs and lopinavir, and the blue one is on raltegravir and uh, lopinavir, where it shows that the virological suppression is almost the same in both. So that means, so you can use this as an alternate regimen. And similar findings is also shown by the ACTG group, which again, this study was conducted uh, largely in our site at YRG Care, where again, we showed that these two regimens are being, you know, non-inferior, thereby, you know, you can strongly recommend as part of a guidelines. So today, in part of the second line therapy, if you cannot use the NRTIs for toxicities, especially AZT, you can use an integrase inhibitor. Or for some reason with severe resistance, if you cannot use NRTIs, you can also use an integrase inhibitor with, um, you know, one of those uh, Proteus inhibitors. You may ask a question, hey, I won't, don't want to use AZT because for toxic for second line, can I recycle this tenofovir? Our second line study shows, yes, you can do this, but on the other hand, there is a word of caution. This is another very large observational study done by a study group called Tino Rest Study Group, which has also been part of this, where we collected data from different regions, from India, Thailand, and many sub-Saharan African countries, where patients who are being initiated on tenofovir containing therapy who had a virological failure, what we found in that is, especially in Africa, people who fail with tenofovir, almost 57% of them have k 65 mutation, which is a mutation for tenofovir. That means if you're recycling, it may not work. And uh, also, there are a lot of other, um, you know, um, um, you know, uh, you know, evidence had been, you know, developed as part of this, you know, study, where if you look into this data for Asia, 
where we have shown almost around 40% of them can have tenofovir resistance. So that means in your clinic, if you recycle tenofovir for second line, 60% will work, 40% it may not work. So you have to have a genotyping before if you are going to recycle the drug, otherwise switch to another alternate drug. A word about um, uh, Donning study, you know, which has been presented last year at the uh, IAS meeting, you know, in Paris uh, last July. What they have shown in that is, can we use the daltegravir along with the two NRTIs part of the second line, if you use NNRTI for first line. Again, this study randomized people who have got um, NNRTI failure into two groups. One group received two NRTIs and daltegravir for second line, another group two NRTIs and a boosted lopinavir. The study went up to 48 weeks. Again, the group showed this regimen with the daltegravir with two NRTI is superior as compared to the standard WHO regimen. That means two NRTIs with daltegravir can be used in resource limited setting. But one caveat again, in this particular study, they also did a baseline resistant testing, thereby they screened out a lot of people who have got a resistance. So that means we are not sure that how we can boldly use this in a resource limited setting to scale up. But again, the same group uh, a couple of months back at retrovirus conference in Boston also have shown that the WHO recommended two NRTIs, that is with uh, tenofovir, uh, three days here FTC with daltegravir, is being very effective, especially in patients who have got NRTI containing mutations. So you will also hear in the next couple of months from various guideline makers, change everyone to tenofovir lemivudine and daltegravir. Someone who initiated on first line therapy because you have got a baseline resistance, someone who are already on uh, TLE with efavirenz, even if they are not suppressed, change them to TLD. People who are failing to, you know, in an RTA, change them to TLD. You know, I'm not saying that it's been something, a movement coming up, but there are also been, there are a lot of observational study going to be developed, especially in implementation science uh, groups to generate whether that approach will be correct to put everyone on tenofovir lemivudine daltegravir, especially who are already on first line therapy, as well as who are already on stable or been failing from first line NNRTI to TLD approach. But you'll hear more from uh, Dr. Cantor later today on his resistant talk. We don't have any randomized clinical trials to answer this, but there is one study currently going called DEF study, which I've been involved in that, and uh, Chennai Vyarja Care has been in involved in this study, so currently it's been ongoing, where we have been recruiting patients who have been failed in NRTI containing therapy, randomized into three different arms. One arm received two NRTIs and a darinavir, another arm receives daltegravir and darinavir, and the third arm is without resistant testing, move them to tenofovir, lemivudine, daltegravir. So this is the only study which can answer this critical question, but it may take another year or so to answer this. Now moving to this third line, again, uh, which you all know that what is a third line regimen. Again, our group, uh, ACTG group, conducted a very large clinical trial called ACTG 5288. So again, being just being presented at the retrovirus meeting. But again, we recruited a very large number of patients, almost 550 patients, who are going to fail the second line. They have been allocated into different groups. A cohort A, that's a group where they did not have resistance to any of the protease inhibitors. They continued the same second line regimen. But other groups, based on the resistant testing, they are being randomized into different, different drugs, either to darinavir, raltegravir, etravirin, or darinavir and uh, raltegravir and NRTIs, or if they have severe mutations, whatever have been available at the site, and, you know, this study went for 48 weeks. The results were being presented at the retrovirus conference. What we have shown is, in groups where we use the resistant testing, and based on that, when we allocate the drugs, they have a suppression anything from 74% to 100%. That means resistant testing really helps. But on the other hand, if they don't have resistance uh, mutations, if you continue the same second line PIs, either aracinavir or lopinavir, where the virological suppression subsequently is much lower. Again, this is a new area of science. Again, we do not know why this happened. Again, virologists in this trial has been currently been working on. Currently in guidelines, what we recommend is if they don't have any PI mutation, continue the same thing. But what we have seen in this is if you continue, they're not further suppressed. Again, this is a new area of science where more virology work is currently been happening. Again, this data has been just presented, not just published yet. So we concluded this third line study stating that even in a resource limited setting, even if you don't have etravirin and other regimens, just darinavir twice daily with ritonavir with raltegravir, which again interchange with the daltegravir, can be very effective to suppress the virus when they have been failing second line. And also we have shown, this is again a new finding, if you are not changing the therapy, 
to a newer regimen, but you're continuing the same second line, even with the resistant testing, again, more than half of the patients, they did not achieve virological suppression. We do not know why. There is a subgroup of virologists been working on whether they have any, you know, um, you know archived mutations of earlier uh, exposure to the drugs, which is causing this, or some other mechanism became resistance, which you will hear in the next couple of weeks or a month, you know, from our group on this. Again, we concluded the study showing that, you know, genotyping after second line is very important, but on the other hand, also caveat of if you continue, what's going to happen on this. So following this, again, the WHO guidelines, we do have of what is for the third line, but also there could be some addendum will happen, even if you don't have etravirin or any other um, uh, drugs, and in India, we do have Maravarag, still Daranavir twice daily and an integrase inhibitor can be very effective in suppressing people who have got failed second line. So this is a WHO guidelines where he very clearly recommend what's for the first line and second and third line. But before I end my talk, I also wanted to show a couple of new things which may, you know, uh, you know, recently been presented and published can change the guidelines in the next couple of years. One other thing is, this is the guidelines being published for Europeans and for Americans last year. What they have shown is someone who has got suppressed viral load, less than 50 copies, you can also use a true drug therapy for maintenance. We are not recommending this currently for resource limited settings because we do not have any evidence on this. You'll hear more on this from Dr. Campbell later today on the true drug approach. Probably we may have some answer from that for the next guidelines. Also a quick word about uh, TAF. We do have generic TAF, that is tenofor elefenafide, which you all know that it's been recently launched in India as a co-formulated with the FTC. So again, you may ask a question, what happens in a resource limited setting on TAF? which you all know that very recently our group published stating that the prevalence of tenofovir renal dysfunction in southern India is almost 5.6%. You know, in your bag, we have put a journal there where that particular article will be there. And now it's been, um, you know, available in India, especially through generic market for the private doctors. So if you have patients who are on tenofovir, you can safely substitute to TAF to prevent these renal toxicities. But on the other hand, again, Dr. Campbell and Dr. Sindels will talk later on on the caution about TAPS interactions with rifampicin. Also, you'll hear tomorrow from Dr. Punga on uh, TAPS usage in pregnancy where we don't have data. So again, you know, it's another gray area of zone. I'm going to end my talk stating that guidelines are to guide us. Don't get, uh, you know, uh, trained in one particular guideline and sit tightly. It keeps changes. So today, we have got a lot of uh, development happening in antiretral therapeutics, newer agents and newer preparations, all this you'll hear today and tomorrow from our speakers. And following the new evidences, our resource limited settings guidelines also tend to change. I'd like to conclude by stating that WHO have done so much to move these guidelines in the last 10 years. So this is something what we are now currently at 2016 to 17 guidelines and there will be some changes will happen later this year, 2018 to 19 with some of those newer findings like dawning study and as well as the two drug therapy and also in 2020 probably with some of the newer preparations you'll hear from Dr. Campbell tomorrow where if it has been relevant for resource limited setting, you know, can also get into this. With this, I'll end my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.